things theology, all things theology We chop it up properly, without an apology Gotta give doxology to God hollow Because this is how we do it at all things theology Yo, grace and peace guys Welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology Where I'm your host K-Dub And today I want to talk about speaking in tongues But before we get into that Make sure you like this video right now, subscribe to the channel if you're not, and as always, click the notification bell so you can be aware when I drop content. So guys, let's get into the topic right now. Speaking in tongues, you know, if you're anything like me, you grew up in a church where that was pretty much a primary emphasis when it came to spiritual gifts or just in general, it was just the primary emphasis. In the name of Jesus, let every uh, you know, people who spoke in spoken tongues were viewed as more spiritual and things like that. Let me take a sip of my uh my great waterloo, by the way. So refreshing. But yeah, I grew up in a church like that where that was the primary emphasis and <laughs> i came to a point where i was wrestling with a particular passage i want to get into that the first time speaking in tongues is mentioned in the bible uh is acts chapter 2 specifically and i was reading this passage let me show you my screen let's do a little quick study here and i came across the passage where people usually quote to say we should speak in tongues and do the coming in a honda <laughs> you know you know how you know how they do it <laughs> Uh, you know, I started reading that passage, start having questions about, wait, is this really what was being done? So let's start at verse one, Acts chapter two, verse one, it says, when the day, day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. That is the apostles um, and, you know, the early, the early disciples. Okay. <clears throat> verse two, and suddenly there came a, from heaven, a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting and they appeared and there appeared to them tongues of fire, distributing, distributing themselves. And they rested on each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit was giving them utterance. And usually that's where people stop and say, see, this is why you should speak in tongues. This was a. You know, something that the when the spirit of God moves, <laughs> you know, the language when the spirit of God moves, you just can't help but to give him praise. And one of the other ways you do this is by speaking in tongues. And, I, and guys, I've heard it all. I've heard all kinds of explanations for why you should speak in tongues. Uh, well, the devil can't hear this prayer language is between you and God. You know, the devil doesn't hear it. You know, it's a more powerful form of prayer. Um, all sorts of explanations you know, for why uh, what's being done in many churches is why you should speak in tongues that way. I'm going to show why I don't think what's done in most churches is actual speaking in tongues from this text here. Let's go on. Verse five. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. So <clears throat> multiple people here who spoke different languages, uh, you know, they were right. Devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. And were be bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. So stop right here. <clears throat> you have them speaking in tongues. And these Jews who are living in Jerusalem and devout men from every nation under heaven hear them speaking <laughs> different languages. Yo, this would be a quite, uh, you know, an amazing uh, act, you know, um, and, and we're going to see how how that's the case. Verse seven. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So like, <laughs> it's a kind of like a low key insult. Like these, these are not intelligent, well-trained men. How do they know this language? And notice it's a real language they're speaking because they hear them speaking in his own language. So stop right there. The first time we hear see speaking in tongues in the Bible, it's a real intelligible known language um and so that's why they're amazed because these are just fishermen these are just these aren't people who are known to be intellectuals in verse 8 how is it that we hear them in our own language to which we were born it's like they're making it very clear like this is a real language that's being spoken of 
And just in case you're curious about uh, what kind of language it was, uh, notice it goes on to say Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and districts of Libya around Serene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. So, What's the importance of this? Well, I believe the importance of this is that this is the early proclamation and spread of the gospel. So first we see tongues having to do with the spread of the gospel. God gave the early disciples the gift of tongues so that men of other nations could uh, hear about Christ, hear about God's workings. And um, so I, what's what's a modern day application of this? And, and this is what I hold to about speaking in tongues could the lord send me on a missionary or anyone for example on a missionary journey and and there have been men who spoke of of having a, an experience and an utterance like this you know to somewhere like mexico or let, let's say because i know a little spanish uh you know russia you know you know <laughs> you know or like um, some some foreign country i don't I, I have no familiarity at all with the language could that happen yes where the Lord gives an utterance and I just start sharing the gospel. Someone starts sharing the gospel that the Lord, and I have no clue what I'm saying. Could the Lord give that? Yes. Amen. But you know, also we do have other means of technology where if we really have that desire, um, <laughs> there are literally apps for that, but I, I'm not limiting God by saying that could not happen. Right. And there are all, and they all continue in amazement and great perplexity, continuing on with the text, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. And so a lot of people will usually go to that and say, say, hey, they look drunk. But no, they, the, the, the point is the men there cannot explain this supernatural act of God, how they know these languages that they just conclude they're drunk, which is a silly reason if you think about it. <laughs> Like, how could the drunk men actually know the language? Like, how would that help them know the language? Right. But Peter answers. Verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. He's like, look, it's too early. <laughs> like dr drunk men usually get drunk at night. Let's be real. Peter's like saying. Um, And so, yeah, he goes on to say, but this is what's spoken of through the prophet Joel. So Peter's like, look, this is prophetic. This is prophetic what's happening here. And it shall be in the last days, God says, interesting language uh, right there. That will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. Wow, we literally see that fulfillment in right here in Acts chapter 2. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women. I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below. And it keeps going forth. Uh, let, let me just read it so I don't. <laughs> the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, but for the great glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so literally Peter just, I mean, you read the rest of this text. Peter just um, goes forth and launches into a gospel action explanation of, of the death of Christ. And it's, it's, it's quite amazing. But here I go to show that the first time speaking in tongues is mentioned, it's a... Uh, you know, it's not what's being done in many churches. It's a real language. And so what many people will do. So what I used to do, we'll go to first Corinthians uh, 14. But hold on, before we go there, we can we admit that Acts chapter two is a real known language. If you if you grant me that, I think what else follows has to go in accordance with that. And, you know, uh, one, one thing I want to mention is, you know, you know, you, you go into these churches and like that's the, you know, the, the Marcus Rogers churches and, you know, the the Benny Hinn type churches. And that's the like emphasis. 
That's the conclusion of the Spirit of God. But you, you read the Bible and speaking in tongues doesn't really happen that often. We may have at most what I'm thinking about four chapters that mention speaking in tongues. Now, what people will do is they'll say, well, that's what baptism of the fire means. And it's like, okay, that's that's an assertion. Um, and so people will try to make some kind of connection with other other things other than, um, you know, speaking in tongues. But nevertheless, just speaking in tongues in general is only mentioned a few times in Scripture. And so many times people will go to 1 Corinthians 14. And, and I always use this as a uh, presuppositional argument because they don't even do it according to uh, this text here. Because Paul is kind of, if you, if you read, he's kind of de-emphasizing uh, or speaking in tongues. Um, if, if, if you read the, the book of 1 Corinthians, you would know very clear that this is a, this is a rebuking letter. <laughs> um, you know, he doesn't stop to four, uh, chapter 14 and start commending them on what they're doing well. This, this whole letter is a rebuke on them. And in this, he's, he's talking about prophecy actually being um, more valuable or, or, or should be more emphasized or, or should be pursued more. And when he says prophecy, we have to understand the definition of prophecy. There is a foretelling and foretelling. Um, foretelling is what you see a lot from the prophets um, declaring, thus saith the Lord. Foretelling, F-O-R-T-H, foretelling is what we do every day when we, we declare what God has already said. And that's what I believe he's actually emphasizing because he says this will be of edification if you read throughout the text. Um, let's see. So a couple of places that I that I see that many people don't like, even if I granted them <laughs> the the uh, coming out of Honda, you know, um, you know, things uh, I, you would have to admit many people do not do this because what, what does Paul say that that tongues is not for the believer but for the unbeliever right uh verse 22 so tongues are a sign not to those who believe but to the unbelievers but prophecy is, a, is is for a sign not to unbelievers but to those who believe and so right here when you hear people speaking in tongues it's often done in the church to believers and so my 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 uh you know um you know argument oftentimes is you guys don't even do it right according to your own your pr profession according to your own interpretation because it also says that it should be an interpreter now <laughs> uh you know verse 27 anyone who speaks in a tongue should be two or three at most which it's usually hundreds of people doing it in each in turn which that's never done and one must interpret and that's never done um <laughs> Uh, but if there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let himself speak to himself and to God. And so I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in the church and where there was never an interpreter. I've never I've never not once heard someone interpret these things uh, to that was, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, spoken and speaking in tongues. And so my argument right now is just, OK, you guys aren't even being consistent with what you uh, what you're saying it is. You know, and so my, my hope is that we will look, OK, hey, maybe you disagree with me in the end. You say, OK, I still do think that the, you know, the coming in a Honda, you know, the speaking in tongues is of God. That's fair. You know, I, I don't I'm not kicking anyone out of the kingdom for that. Um, there's there's a liberty right here for disagreement on non-essential issues. But I do think there should be some thinking more critically, especially with the text in Acts 2 that I gave that show that it is. A legit language um, also you would have to agree with me that most churches that do do these speaking in tongues in the way that you're saying we should do them don't do them um, biblically even even according to their own assertions and so hey look if you disagree with me that's fine let's chop it up let's talk about it we can be uh, you know as as Paul says hey let's 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 uh, show love even despite this disagreement but yeah guys I hope you enjoyed this video 
You guys know how we do it here at All Things Theology. Till next time, grace and peace. Hamanda aka ata raka te de baka sanda ata ambo osa katarite eke banda ata rike.